All right, guys. Uh, so this is with great pride and joy. <laughs> He's directing. <laughs> um, it's great pleasure to see Kema for here. Uh, anyway, uh, so Kema for graduated from LSDIS lab, University of Georgia, and now that the soul of LSDIS lab is here at Noesis. <laughs> It's so wonderful to have her back here, especially after having achieved um, success that, of course, I can be very proud of. <laughs> um, just what goes to show us uh, something that she has achieved, well, you guys know, uh, yeah, they, 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 they all um, uh, put you on a pedestal because oh, well. you are the only one who have Worldwide, we have 2,005 uh, <laughs> and seven publications. <laughs> she has won this uh, Worldwide Web also. Um, and um, I think that promise followed through. Um, I uh, shared with her she, something she did not, may or may, did, not uh, did not perhaps know. Uh, at uh, this NSF panel, we have 18 submissions. Uh, I mean, you know, by far and away the best uh, 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 submission. So uh, I think uh, it relates perhaps to um, the talk that she's going to give today, a general area of that. So, and and in fact, um, she gave a tutorial at the Sigma? No, as the Lucy. As the Lucy. And um, um, uh, it, it is this area that you hear her talk about where she is. She's first and has established a clear presence uh, that you know now others would have to follow in a way. So with, again, uh, the other uh, other interesting thing here is that I'm also proud to see her um, uh, students doing very well. So um, uh, one of um, her students gives me a little bit of credit for convincing her to uh, uh, convert from masters to PhD. And uh, I think she's proud of that student now. Uh, so that's also wonderful to know. She, and that student uh, is going to do internship, uh, going to do internship at IBM Watson. Uh, so, welcome. Thank you. It is really a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, you can just take everything he said and just kind of cut to, cut to the <laughs> half. It's, it's uh, I guess, a pro I always introduce him as my academic father. So it's like a proud dad. They always kind of, you know, exaggerate. And um, so anyway, I've been lucky is the best way to describe my experience. And what I will share with you is, yes, I will talk about some of this work that he's mentioned. But I will just um, um, share with you what I see now as um, the challenges and opportunities for uh, uh, um, um, data processing or data management uh, research in, uh, of, with respect to semantic web data. And a lot of it has been driven by, you know, uh, trying to deal with the scalability issues. Everyone is talking about big data now, and so in trying to address these, I've, I've I think, encountered some what I think are interesting. So, so th this is my take on, 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 on it. Um, so a couple of things that we that we have to address. Um, we there there um, we have to meet the challenge of new requirements for new query models. So one of the things that we're, we're encountering is there, there's a lot of data now. So the big data uh, um, uh, stories that you know there's a growing amount of data. And this is also happening in the semantic web space. We have uh, I didn't want to show, show the LOD cloud because I'm sure you guys have seen it a gazillion times. But um, so there's a large amount of data, but there's also a large number of uh, consumer consumer applications. So ba basically, applications and domains that are interested in consuming um, 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 semantic web data. And all of these applications don't have the same querying requirements. Some people want more graph structured queries. Some people need, you know, they're different. So I'm just going to show a little chart uh, in a few minutes. But basically, there are new, um, it's be, there are new querying requirements be, be, beyond select project join, which is what we typically do, like in the uh, Sparkle style queries and so on. So we have to meet those challenges. Uh, we have to meet the challenges. We have to meet those challenges and meet the challenges of scale. So we have to do these new and more complex query models and we have to do them on very large data. So the scale issue doesn't go away. And of course, I'm sure you guys have heard of the other dimensions of big data, which are velocity, veracity, and so on. Uh, so we have to do that. And one of the interesting uh, kind of um, 
um, dimensions to this is that we now have, in trying to meet this dimension of scale, there are some new computing models, and of course, uh, Google, when Google jumps, everybody asks how high. So a few, a few years ago, Google kind of introduced, or kind of not introduced because it is something that existed in the functional programming world, but they kind of talked about their own version of this whole MapReduce programming model and how, it, how they use it to deal with their big data problems. And so, of course, everybody's now doing that, Facebook, Yahoo, and so on. So, but there's some interesting things that have, so that's the space I've been working in uh, a little bit more recently. Um, but the challenge with this is what I see is that it's a new computing model, and it has some impact in query planning, query optimization. The cost models are very different from what we're used to in, you know, if you do a relational query optimization, for example, and so on. So we have to address these things. And then, oh, I see you on my one unfinished slide, but um, um, which I'm trying to remember what it is, but I'm sure I'll remember down the line. So there's question mark, question mark, which even I don't know what it's supposed to be at this point. So, so that's that. So there are a couple of challenges, and um, I wanted to kind of just to give you a feel for um, the different kinds, when I said new kinds of um, uh, consumer applications. So this is just uh, a slide that my student made from um, ISWC last year, so last fall. And these are some of the different applications that we see now um, uh, that are using, these are submissions to, you know, papers at ISWC. So basically try to categorize them into topics. And you see they're kind of all over the place, right? So, um, you know, geo stuff, smart cities, biomedicine, finance and all kinds of things. So all of these wildfire monitoring, that was an interesting one to me. Um, so all of these things are basically uh, different kinds of applications requiring different things. Okay, so so yes, coming back to that, we do have a growing amount of data. I think as of uh, December last year, sometime in the fall last year, we'll have this uh, organization, the Open Science Data Cloud, that has delivered one petabyte of scientific data that's represented um, using uh, RDF. So this is, we're now talking about um, petabytes of data in, in the semantic web world. So this is basically data that was converted from from other kinds of sources. So, so the science data means uh, biology? Or? So, uh, okay, different kinds of science. Yeah, and they have put as they, they, they have put links, as many links as they, you know, but I think the, the, the goal is to continue to link them up. So there's bio, there's all kinds of things. Um, so um, I mentioned the increasing uh, diversity of com com uh, consumer applications. And so this is now just basically what I summarized in the previous uh, slide, which is we have to deal with scale of data, higher query complexity, and throughput. Uh, because when you have a large amount of data, and a lot of people want, a lot, uh, um, this access to this data, you mean you 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 have a lot of throughput in terms of number of queries that um, that come to your data source. So and then you have to deal with the three comp this new computational model. So altogether, this melting pot is what I will talk about. Now, let me just uh, along the way highlight um, with respect to query models. I'm going to kind of use the query models. Lens. And one query model that we're very familiar with is querying using keywords. So I'm going to talk a few, a little bit about a, a keyword search and what, what I think are the challenges there. Um, so what we are used to, and you know, anytime I talk about this, I start off with this and I immediately get resistance to some very Google, uh, you know, um, ambassadors and so on, and they tell me how well Google is doing. And Google does very well. And, uh, but, I, I, but I will say a but, and I think you will agree with me, to a certain degree towards the end of this section. So Google does, uh, does well if you're interested in finding what I would call an entity. So if you think about really the uh, um, history of the web, the goal was basically a uh, browser, the goal of browsers is to take you from one page to another, where a page represents some kind of resource. Web page for a company, your web page, and so on and so forth. So that's really the model that they are focusing on. They've, they've done uh, phenomenally well. And um, finding the documents, not entities. Well, yeah, let, so let me just say that. The, they have gone to the no, no. When I say, I mean, the, the page represents a doc, an entity, right? And you'll see, you'll see the distinction in a minute. So, uh, so for that, um, you know, what they primarily do is kind of IR style um, 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 processing where you just take a set of keywords and you match on a document and you try to, and of course they have their ranking model and so on. But basically the, the whole idea here is that a query is, the meaning of a query is basically um, the, the matches, the collection of matches uh, uh, in, uh, of the words in the, in the query. So oftentimes what you and I have to do is we have a list of results. They don't all mean the same thing. So if you think about you know, a, 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 a SQL query, right? When you write a query, find me all students in 
uh, Lewis's lab, you will get a list of students, and all these students are equivalent with respect to that semantics. They are all students of uh, an OSS lab. You don't get like something is a, a TV and some students, and you know, which is what we get on uh, Google. You get a bunch of uh, results. Some of them are related to the intent, your intention or the meaning that you intended, and some are not. And we just go through looking at the links and deciding what it is that we want. So results are very heterogeneous, not like database uh, query results. But there are a couple of other, so, so we've learned to live with this, and that's why we think everything is fine. But there are a couple of other dimensions that I think we should think about. So if we recall that in the semantic web, everything is not required to be explicitly stated, right? So you can have something like Kema 4 teaches, this is a course I'm teaching this semester, uh, database uh, CSC 500. Hmm? It doesn't anywhere say in this collection that Kema 4 is a CS faculty. And let's say I now want to find a list of uh, faculty members, computer science faculty at NC State. Well, if you're using this match paradigm, you're never going to find me because it was a, never explicitly stated that Kema 4 was a, a CS faculty. What the semantic web allows us to do is we have, we have some explicitly stated information and then we have some ways of inferring, um, of, of inferring a, a knowledge that is implicit in, in the model that we have, right? So for example, if we know that uh, the domain of teachers, so everybody that teaches something is a faculty, and if I kind of know that CSC 540 is a CS course, then I can put all that together. And when somebody asks for the list of CS faculty, I can get, uh, you'll find chemical. But if you use the traditional matching, model, you will not find it. So, so the semantic web, so if you just use this dev style, it doesn't work very well. The other thing is with the, um, what I mentioned earlier. So now, when I talk about the limitations of Google, I use personal experiences. I have a file in my document, and anytime I have a failed Google experience, I, write, I document this query so that I have many motivating examples to share with people. So these are a couple of them. So I wanted to propose a tutorial at www, and I was trying to find out if if, if any of the previous www conferences had done stuff on big data or you know semantic web kind of big data, so that I would you know I would know whether they would be interested in my my tutorial or not, and of course that was very hard to do. So I'm going to do www conferences big data tutorial. You're not going to find you will find a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with what I asked for. So unless I manually go to 2012, look at a list of tutorials 2011, and so on, and maybe try a few more years. Um, I can't find what I want. This other one, the second query was one that I tried last summer, and after trying for about a month, I literally gave up. So my, I have a, a, well, now 10th grader, but she was a 9th grader last year. And I was interested in, a, a number of universities run high school summer camps. And I was interested in uh, math and science uh, summer camps. So I was interested in getting my daughter to enroll in a math and science summer camp, kind of run at it give her a little bit of the university experience because they get to board for a month and so on. So just getting her ready for college. So first of all, I, so I wanted to try to find these kind of summer camps. And there was a little caveat. So, uh, but, but even minus, uh, eliminating the caveat is just find, just trying to find a list of university science summer camps was, I mean, I almost, I was, I've never been so frustrated, which is why I cannot, I can never forget this query. It was the most frustrating experience for me. Um, now, um, the other additional complexity to the query was that my daughter is a ninth grader, like I said. Many of the high school summer camps don't allow ninth graders, they only allow 10th and up. There were a few that would allow ninth graders. So to find those that would allow ninth graders was yet a, 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 a more difficult problem. I mean, you had to literally try to find each one, look at every university, see if in the list of requirements, ninth graders were allowed. And after trying for whatever, I just literally just gave up. So my daughter didn't go for uh, her summer camp last month. So these kinds of, and this query is not, this was a real need. It's not like I just started and I started thinking, oh, well, how, what is it that Google does wrong? These are needs that I have. And there are needs that you, are, you have these days on, on the internet. We're trying to use the internet for much more than just finding web pages. And really, I believe that the next generation search, search engines have to address our real needs. So, so the bottom line is um, we need two things. One is to understand that queries are not going to always be about single resources. For those, Google does well, which is a resource that can be represented as a single page. All the keywords will be on that page. Google will find it for you. Um, for what the second kind of queries, like you know, uh, have www, conference, www conferences with tutorials or you know, university summer camps, so those are what we call list queries. For those queries, you, your answer is not a single page, it's actually a list of pages. So there might be right state, 
summer camp and NC State summer camp and you know Ohio State summer camp. There will be a list of answers, each of them equivalent with, uh, with respect to my, my query. Those kinds of queries are queries that Google and the tra current traditional search engines do not address. And so we call those list queries versus entity queries where I would say an entity is represented by maybe a single, a single web page. Now, if somebody has gone, because sometimes you have some very nice uh, people, especially like maybe PhD students, they try to compile a resource, they make a web page of all related conferences and all this. Somebody has taken this list and pre-compiled it into a single resource, then Google may find it for you, right? But this will not be the case for every kind of list that you and I are interested in. So, so we need to be able to deal with those kinds of queries, and we need to be able to interpret queries beyond just match. It's not matching keywords, like I said, because there may be things that may not be explicitly stated. We need a notion of, an inter of interpreting a query. What is the meaning of this query? And then try to find answers. Um, so, from the point of view of database processing, because I always kind of try to go back. We've learned a lot from database research. So. Uh, uh, in, when we say interpret a query, what we, want, what we want is an intended semantic. So basically we want to go from an unstructured query, query that has no structure, and somehow make, get some structure out of it, right? So pin it to a specific semantics. And that way I can query my database using a traditional spark. So for example, I can translate an a keyword query to Sparkle, uh, which is a structured query, and then I could query that using, um, uh, using uh, RDF databases. Uh, the challenge, of course, so there are one or two, so that Tran is another guy who's worked, who's done work in terms of interpretation in this way. In fact, I think he was probably the first one. Uh, but the challenge there was um, interpretation is not always unique because keyword queries are ambiguous, right? They're just a couple of words here and there. And if you put them together, they could mean a comp uh, so many different things. So their heuristic, uh, what Tran did was that their heuristic top care approaches for dealing with um, interpretations, basically what is the most likely intended interpretation for a query. So once again, um, this whole uh, Google style play god, which uh, you know, I always oppose a one size fits all approach to anything when it comes to uh, accessing data because I think people have different needs. So with the heuristic top care approaches, you come up with a set of heuristics that says, okay, the most likely uh, intended interpretations are the most frequent ones, or the ones that occur most frequently in the database. That's not necessarily true, right? So this is another example that happened to me. <laughs> um, and I think last year I was at Sigma, and in the middle of a conference, somebody was talking, and I remembered um, um, uh, the uh, I remember the query optimization technique magic sets. So I wanted to look it up, and obviously, I mean, I was completely immersed in, in the database whole whatever. So I wasn't thinking about magic sets actually possibly meaning anything else. It didn't even occur to me at the time. I just typed magic sets expecting Google to deliver to me what I wanted. And of course, Google gave me a whole page of toys, right? Had absolutely nothing to do with what I was asking. Now, had we had some contextual information and there, you know, there are simple things we could do and of course more sophisticated things. I was right in the middle of a database talk. I mean, I was at a conference, a top conference, database context clearly, in the middle of a talk, why are you giving me stuff about toys? If I was in Toys R Us, that's a different, totally different thing, right? So now, you could say, well, so he, trans approach will probably say, okay, magic set occurs, because obviously magic set is a very, very uh, advanced query optimization technique, so it will not occur frequently, it's something that's very, you know, very few people will be talking about, right? So if you want to use this whole frequency model, it will always be ranked low in terms of interpretation, right? But for me, it was very important at that particular time. So, um, so besides trying to use the things like trying to use kind of location and so on and so forth, which we're kind of looking at in the future, but they're very simple things we could do. Every query I was there and every query that I had done prior to this had to do with database processing. Had nothing, to, I mean, either I was looking up some other paper, it may not be magic sense, but something to do with databases, right, and research or publications. So at least if you look at my previous history, right, now, somebody's going to say Google does, and I'll tell you what the difference is. But if you look at my previous my query history, you should be able to, oh, maybe the context here is a little bit different. And then maybe in the evening, because it is very possible that in the evening I decide to go shopping, because I have a son, he's nine, year, nine, nine years old, and he, could, he very much would like uh, magic sets, you know, the toys. So it's very possible that in the evening I decide I'm, after the session, uh, you know, the, whatever, I said I'm going shopping, and my context changes, and I type magic sets again, and my context should be now toys, right? So... Um, maybe I had just asked the query about where Toys R Us is or something like that. 
that should at least tell my search engine that I'm talking now, you know, I'm going, I'm heading towards, I'm talking about toys, I'm more concerned about toys, and so my interpretation should change. This is really what um, my interest is in trying to find a way to uh, enable a contextual query interpretation uh, process. Now, so, Google now is supposed to be working, you know, yes, there, so yes, what, right? yes. So, so let me tell you what uh, the, the difference is. So, key difference, like I said, is Google does entity queries. So when they say, and what they are actually, what they, they still do this business of um, 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 most frequent. So, so there's a difference between your ambient context and what they consider. What they will do is they will look at your query history and they profile you. And this is one of, uh, I think profiles tend to uh, give you kind of long-term interest. For example, I mean, if you're going to profile me now based on this magic set, are you going to call me, I'm a mother, so Toys are as important to me as anything, but I'm a researcher, I need to have a job, right? So both this notion of profiling me into being either a researcher or don't, don't, doesn't really make sense to me. I think it has some... some. I, I think uh, here is my uh, theory, and I could be too day off. Mm -hmm. I believe that to some extent it comes down to uh, the expressiveness of the language you use to uh, capture the context. So I'm guessing that much of the way context is captured in... Um, uh, you know, by Google, uh, because it has to be efficiently implemented, is as a vector. Yeah. No, so, no, so the, no, so that's 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 part of it. But the problem is, like I said, is the ambient your current. So it's one thing that you take something and you pre-process and then you use it over time. What I want is as my ch context is changing. So basically, real time. That's a one fundamental difference between what they're doing. They're based, they can use your query log and they can mine everybody's pattern and they say, okay, everybody who's doing my magic sets is kind of, and they will, you know, people who do magic sets previous to that, if they do this, uh, maybe that's, you know, what, what um, that the intention may be that. So it's not real time. It's not like it will move from afternoon to evening. Um, if I type the same query, magic sets, it will change from the- I thought they're, they're supposed to be doing that. I, so they, they have notion of time, in fact, uh, when you do the query at the time of your going home, uh, that same query would have different result than if you do it. Uh, yes, you know, uh, this exactly. So this sorry. is this is also based on general pop. So basically, time going home, everybody 5 p.m. It's kind of coming up with a general consensus for everybody. Right. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, I think there's some queries for which if this makes sense, but it, to try to do more individualized, more personalized is is not something that I see. And also, the class of queries is completely different. So. But, but the, and here's the hypothesis, and mm -hmm. some students may want to uh, check out or think more about it. Hypothesis is that uh, you, 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 have, you have to represent context somehow, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay? And uh, think or guess what is the representation um, language they are using or could be using to represent context. Vis a vis, think uh, the uh, more richer um, language or representation of context, which would be uh, label graph. Uh, and it is unlikely that Google is using label graph as a mechanism to represent the sun. So if you have label graph now, uh, you know, with the entity, uh, you could be going to uh, very, uh, you know, the same other entity in two, with, with, with two different contexts. Person works for mm -hmm. company, person has stock in the company. Entire different, you can capture that. Or you can capture, you know, uh, very, you know, uh, different uh, uh, relationships and taking to all kinds of uh, totally different things. Uh, which is uh, with the semantics tied with the label per se, as opposed to uh, statistics, uh, you know, which leads to a vector specification uh, representation. So, big. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so in fact, that's what, that's exactly similar to what we did. So, I'll show I'll yeah. share you. I'll share with you what we did, and I'll tell you what Google's response because they were at ISWC 2011 no, or whatever. Let me ask another question. Sure, so, sure. So, there means search engines that uh -huh. look, look at different. Uh, uh, interpretations mm -hmm. when the query is ambiguous, mm -hmm. and then they provide uh, result sets for each of those interpretations and let you pick which uh, uh, cluster you want to essentially investigate. Yes, this is no, kind no. of result, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so what, what's your take on that? Because so, to me, in some sense, eventually it is you who can decide what you have in mind at that point yes. in time, right? So, so I, I have, so th that's kind of result segmentation. They take, they, they give you, they do a, a, a normal kind of blind IR and then they try to cluster and then to give you the result, which is perfectly fine. Obviously what we're trying to do is automate as much as possible. All I'm saying is without some, without any, just the fact that, you know, 
people have multiple queries that they do issue that are related to each other. How, how can we leverage that? So that user doesn't have to, imagine if you have to keep selecting and telling, you know, for each search you have to do multiple steps. You send me back a cluster, then I go back, you know. So as much of that as we can remove, I think is, um, is, will, be, will be useful. I, uh, sure, sure. So, yeah, isn't it a big privacy problem when you're actually trying to maintain so much of context about a person? Yes, okay, so, yeah, so, so I'll tell you what we've done. And um, and all right now we're trying to you we're trying to um, uh, keep right now is your query what you asked before. Um, there's nothing else. I mean that's why I said it would be nice to have like location and so on and so forth. These are things that people can opt in or opt out for, and you know we can talk about the privacy issues. But all I'm looking at is just what you asked before and how can I use that to improve improve uh, the interpretation process. So I'll tell you what we did. So I'll just give another example. Now, this is not an example I did, but this is an example that we use sometimes. So this is an example, let's say you type in Mississippi River Bank. Hmm? So it turns out that in the, there is actually a financial institution called Mississippi River Bank, right? And of course, we know that there's a receipt, Mississippi River and it has banks and so on and so forth. So a couple of different ways to look at it. So uh, this is just kind of uh, uh, what we're saying is, assume, so this is a contrived uh, data set just to show the example. But assume these, the colors kind of show the different hits, you know, matches for the, the words. So what we're saying is, assume that your concept, context is, you're trying to, you're looking for mortgage loans, right? So maybe your previous qu qu uh, uh, query was mortgage loan rates or something like that, right? Or some person was looking for, uh, had typed something that was related to phishing or phishing techniques or something like that. These are two potential um, contexts. So what, we, what we're saying is, um, we have a graph, we use, a, a, I mean, a, a schema, our concepts in the semantic web are represented using graph, just like Dr. Shet was, was alluding to, right? So what we're saying is we can use a weighted graph model. Okay, so let me step back a, a minute. So typically what happens is in, the, in this interpretation process is you find all the hits, just like Google would, would do, you find all the hits to a word, but now because we have a graph, what we have to, we don't have like documents like they have. What you do is to create a document, so to speak, is you find, you create a, a connecting subgraph, like a standard tree or something that connects all the hits of your, work, of, your, um, of your keyword query. And you basically create, quote unquote, let's say, a document or a subgraph that, that, that represents uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the interpretation of that query. That's how query interpretation is done. So I would take, in this case, this is a very simple example, all the words, kind of um, uh, hit the same node, so the subgraph is just a single just a single node, very, very close, small subgraph, because the goal is always also to find a small subgraph, uh, because that kind of implies closer relationship. But you may have something like Mississippi here, river here, and bank maybe somewhere else, and so you're going to try to find a subgraph that connects them and return that as a particular result. So that's how, that's how it's done um, in this in the graph world. Now, what we're saying is we're using graphs, so um, I can capture this query history very in a very simple manner. I have a, instead of just having a, an unweighted graph, I use a weighted graph model. Hmm? So each time you query about something, I just increase the weights. Well, uh, we have to kind of do the inverse, but think of it as increasing. We increase the weights of, of the concepts that are associated with the query, right? So let's say I was, um, this is, uh, let's, so let's, let's just imagine um, that these are kind of the weights that we had um, on this graph. So um, to find the, weight, the total weight for this subgraph, Mississippi River and Bank, together is a connected subgraph, total weight is something like three. Okay, so but let's now, um, let's assume that my previous query was uh, mortgage rate. So before, before uh, we had had two here. So uh, with, the, with the query mortgage rate, we essentially increase, but in the graph problem, we, because we're trying to find a minimum standard tree, increase actually means decrease. So we go from, from, um, from two to one in this case. Huh? So now this, this basically the weight, by doing this, each time I do this, um, I, I modify the weights of the concepts that, were, that are hit and kind of, uh, the weights of concepts around it, right? I kind of propagate, use a decayed model to kind of propagate. Uh, so, so I would re decrease the weight for this and maybe by half and then this by a quarter and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, I can capture your ambient context, your current context, whatever it is in real time, right? And that way, when I ask the question Mississippi River Bank and I calculate 
I co com compute a subgraph. So in this case, this is Mississippi River Bank as one example. This is also Mississippi River Bank, for example. This subgraph will be weighted three, and this subgraph will be weighted two. And in a minimum standard tree problem, we're inverting it. So this is actually a better, a better um, um, answer. So that would be ranked higher. If in the future, if on the other hand, um, if on the other hand, my previous uh, um, query had to do with fishing, then I would do kind of, you know, here would be decreased by one and the other would stay exactly the same. And so my minimum standard tree would be uh, uh, two in this case. So, so basically this is, how, uh, this is how we are trying to capture um, what your query is. We just mark it on the schema graph as a weighted graph and the weights of this graph change. With, with query whatever, so that when I explore the graph to compute the minimum standard tree, the minimum standard tree can change with context very easily. So that's what we're doing in that space. Now, when I presented this, Google people asked, but how, how can you scale? How can you scale this, right? So there are a couple of issues uh, with respect to scaling this because doing, coming up the, with the model and so on was great, but we're, uh, this perspective only looks at one user. So for multiple users, Right, so that's what my student is going to complete before he leaves in a few weeks. But for multiple users means your weighted graph is going to be completely different from my weighted graph and her weighted, because in your weighted graph maybe you're fishing, so your, your weights are completely different from my weights, right? So how many of these graphs can you have running around in memory, right? And when you're doing the graph exploration, basically there's a search space exploration, you have so many cursors going, and one for you, one for... So that's really a scalability issue. And so we started looking at that kind of in the past couple of months. And the whole idea is to, to separate, to index, so create an indexing scheme that allows us to have a static structure and then the dynamic part is, is represented separately from the graph. Because the static structure of the graph doesn't change. So there's no point replicating it for each person. The structure of the graph stays the same. What's changing are the mapping to the weights. So basically have a separate web indexing and, that, uh, and, and keep those indexes small so that we can um, and then finally, the other thing we're doing is completely doing away with the issue of graph exploration. So we have to represent this, uh, come up with indexes so that we don't have to create these minimum standard trees by graph exploration. That takes some time. So we're dealing with some of the scalability issues there, but I just wanted to, to highlight. There's some more interesting context, contextual things. We try to look at, okay, how can we, because a lot of the time there's some issues, like in this case, bootstrapping, right? So if I don't, when I, when I'm at state zero and I don't have query history, we have to rely on exactly what you just said. We have to ask the user, what uh, try to do some, come up with a default ranking mechanism, and then ask the user to select otherwise if that's not, and then that kind of primes the system. But we started looking at, okay, maybe I can look at what I'm, what, what I'm doing with my friends, what kind of interaction I'm doing with my friends, what chatting I'm doing with my friends. Maybe. Because oftentimes when I'm working on a paper, I'm working with my students, and we're on GTOP, right? So, so even if I haven't said anything about databases, but Pramashri is working on it and we've been chatting, maybe that can influence my context. But that gets into the privacy issue. And we have that we haven't started looking at as well. So yes. Uh, so is there any kind of statistics on how many people actually look at co contextual, uh, or how many people follow a contextual query? Uh, follow. What is following? Like, like in terms of yeah, looking at the previous logs. Huh. So is there a possibility of a person actually typing Mississippi River to find the river after the loan? Yes. Uh, so this is context switching. Context switching. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is yes. Yeah. So this is another. Um, so right now, we, we the way we deal with it is we will we will, may not be able to detect this. Um, we need other sources of context, right? Like I said, we're trying to look at maybe what's happening in social space and so on, which require but we're, we're run into the problems of privacy. But right now, the default mechanism is if we if we do give you the wrong query, you can you can we we give you the alternatives to pick from, right? So you can redirect, and then. Um, so there's always, I mean, you're not going to override the user in any way. You're just trying to help and not give so many poor results because really that whole filtering process is time consuming. So if we don't do it right, then um, so So that's just um, a search. Um, now we're going to move kind of to structured queries, right? So, um, and so to do that, I just want to, I'm, I'm sure all of you kind of know what idea of data looks like and you know how it's modeled and how I just want to, uh, refresh that because I'm going to refer to it a lot. So, you know, we have that we have um, uh, IDF data is modeled in terms of triples or, or you know, has a graph model as well uh, because you can map triples to graphs. Um, so, and we have these uh, queries, and this is a very simple one. Uh, you have basically triples, 
but then with, ha with variables in some positions. So variables are denoted by a uh, question mark, uh, then some, like, some um, strip. So and the time is you take each triple pattern, um, you go and match a triple pattern in the data. So you can think of it, I'm going to refer a lot to relational querying techniques because there's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels in what is done uh, in, in IDF query processing and relational processing. So you go and you basically take your triple model and you apply a filter condition, right? So this is select. You say, find me all the tuples that have property equals type and object equals vendor. That's the, typically the first step, right? So you do that for all your query, uh, for all your, um, your triple patterns, right? And then basically when you have an agreement here, that's what, what we would, uh, that's an implicit join condition. You say, okay, this value here must agree with that value here, must agree with that value here. So that's a join. And so we, we can use um, a relational query plan to represent exactly what's happening here. And that's exactly how uh, it is done in most of these systems. Uh, now, when you have multiple joins, the key challenge is figuring out which should go first. We already know that in most cases for query planning, you do your filter and your projections and, and, and so on as early as possible because that reduces your, the size of your, your data, right? You try joins and Cartesian products are very expensive operations. You try to reduce the inputs as early as possible. So you do that and so... Now, compared to the relational databases, mm -hmm. do you have the benefit of uh, selectivity uh, I'm coming uh, to function that. for I'm coming to that labels? Uh, so, 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 so uh, I'm coming to that in a second. So, uh, so here, um, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of harp on what he's talking about here. Uh, so the general, but if this were in the relational world, uh, if, assuming you just loaded this into Oracle or MySQL or whatever, right? So the, the major job will be for it, the planner, to figure out should this join be done before this or should that one be done before this? That's typically its job. And uh, basically the better plan is the one that if you size, if, you, if you're able to estimate the size of the intermediate results, and sum that up as basically the cost of the plan, the one with the smallest size should come first, right? Because you're trying to. So, so that's, um, that's generally how it works. But um, the major thing is this, this data model is very fine grained, right? You, you typically have, uh, you just have these three columns and basically each triple is talking about what would normally be an attribute or in, in, in a relational model. So because of that, you know, everything is kind of chopped up into the small pieces. So your average workload has many, many joins, many more joins than you would have in a typical uh, relational space, right? So for example, this is a data uh, collection about some products and vendors and so on. So in a relational model, everything about a vendor will be in one relation, already grouped together, kind of, you know, all linked together in one tuple. There'll be multiple attributes of a single tuple. You don't have to join them together to get this information. So because of that, we have several orders of magnitude. So basically to get information between vendors and their offers is maybe one join, right? But to do that in the relational case, and in the RDF case, we have many, many more joins. And I, so at IWC, I heard um, Brian at Systap saying that they have workloads that have 150 joins. So joins we know are expensive. This is kind of, um, 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 kind of you know, what everybody kind of knows and understands. Um, and basically, we've mapped this, this whole process into relational, uh, um, relational query processing, but uh, uh, we, there are a few things that, that we, we are a little bit different. So typically, in relational optimization, like he was alluding to, there are a number of things that are assumed. They are assumed you know your schema and type information is known ahead of time. In the IDF case, we don't know this, but typically we get around this by assuming that we've preloaded the data and somehow kind of, you know, so we can find a way to work around that problem. So we know the schema, uh, schema problem, schema is supposed to be known a priority, a priori, but in our case it comes with data. Uh, we have also mentioned that workloads in the relational case have far fewer joints. You will find, if you read the uh, paper by Selinger, he will say that typically they don't expect uh, queries to have more than 10 joints. This is 10 joints is like big in a uh, relational database space, right? So now why is that important? What I found is that, oh, so let me talk about the third thing. The other thing is that if you look closely at the relational join estimation formula, it relies, it doesn't say that, but it relies on something. It relies on this notion of having constraints, right? So the relational model has constraints like, you know, you know foreign key constraints. And foreign key constraints say, if there's a value here, 
there must be a value here, right? So I cannot talk about a faculty a course being taught by a faculty that doesn't exist and a course that doesn't exist. There must be you know, a foreign key pointing to a course, and that course value must exist in the course table. Otherwise, it fits. Hmm? So you have a set inclusion relationship. All the values in the in the uh, in the teachers portion must be a subset of all the courses, or must be a subset of all the faculty members. This subset relationship allows their, if you look at the way they estimate joints, it's estimated as it's like a joint probability. And this works very well if you have this, this set inclusion, um, set inclusion uh, dependency. But in the semantic web, we have no such thing, right? There's no such thing about this value must exist. I can point to something and that thing doesn't have to exist. Nobody says it has to exist anyway, right? So we don't have this notion of uh, uh, integrity constraints. Um, um, except you know beyond kind of the the domain and range and so on and so forth. So, what has happened in the past? And it just dawned on me a couple of months ago. What has happened in the past? Yes, we've used and you know Angela struggled with trying to do joint, joint estimation by using the relational way, right? And you will get terrible estimates because now if you use these very nice synthetic benchmarks like BSBM and LEBM, they generate data with a nice distribution and everything is nicely linked together. So you run experiments and everything works well. And then you deploy a real data and you realize it's, that's rubbish, right? Because you try to do this on DBPD, it's no such, no such distribution at all, right? So we, we initially, we all, ha all we had was LUBM and BSBM, and so we didn't have a large DPPD and so on. Yago. So you run these nice experiments, and nobody's paying attention to the fact that um, this is giving us kind of a false sense of security that we've done, we've done query processing very well. Huh? Then the other thing is that um, if you are, when you're dealing with small, amounts of data, hmm, 10 gig, 20 gig, blah, blah, blah. If you're off by 10%, 20%, it's not a big deal. You, don't, you may not feel it that much. Now, 10% and 20% off in petabytes of data, then you start to feel it, right? So this is now why we're starting to see um, uh, that, these, that we really have to go and revisit this whole, um, although all these systems that you know about are using exactly the relational query model, I, tend to, I believe that it's going to come back and it is showing in our results that you ha we have to do a little bit more thinking about how we do this, so we can't assume this anymore. The other thing that is, um, um, the other thing that's um, also related to, you know, kind of uh, the, the, the assumptions that I made, um, and if you look at the, the book by, from Stanford, it will tell you that, you know, the model works, they assume kind of uniform distribution of, you know, between values and tuples, so there should be five, if you teach a, each faculty member teaches on average about five courses or something like that, it's kind of uniform distribution between faculty and courses, something. Uh, but you will find that when you're dealing with web data, it's very, very different. So I just give some simple examples. I don't have any Twitter followers. I actually don't have a Twitter account, so I'm zero, right? <laughs> so, so, but look at people like Lady Gaga. I mean, they have like the people, lots of people who don't have anything else to do, who follow Lady Gaga. And they have, she has like 33 million and uh, Justin Bieber, and I'm sure my daughter is one of these ones. Uh, <laughs> so there's Justin Bieber, and uh, they have 33 million followers. So if you look at the friend of whatever, followish, followership graph, there'll be people like me who have very little, in fact zero, in fact I don't exist in the graph, and there'll be, you know, the distributions are going to be very, 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 um, not uniform at all. Very few people will have this kind, these kind of numbers. And we'll see some of the impact of that in query, in query processing. Okay, so why is why do I care about this multiplicity? So I'm going to, you know, basically it says that um, uh, multiplicity for, for the followership relationship for Lady Gaga, of, of a followership relationship is very, very kind of, uh, is all over the place. So why do we care? Now, back to with the relational model again. So now let's assume that we do what they're doing now which is you take, a ta uh, I, I said to you that we have to do a lot of joins, right? So that's, what, that's kind of the general idea. We have a single table, or you can vertically partition, it doesn't really make any difference um, with, in, in the context of this discussion. But basically you have a table, and then you have to, you have a couple of tables, that, uh, or you have one table and you have to self-join, but you have to do a number of joins. Now, and I'm talking about, I'm saying that there are some relationships that have multiple values. So in the case of, uh, um, Lady Gaga, this would be kind of Lady Gaga, and there will be like 33 million entries in this table. So why is this important? This is important because just imagine this is Lady Gaga. Uh, we're trying to join this with, um, 
with this, right? We're going to say Lady Gaga equals Lady Gaga here, whatever her ID is. And when we try to join, we generate combinations because it's going to match each, each value here is going to match its corresponding value over there. So you're going to generate combinations. And those combinations are going to join with more combinations and so on and so forth. So I show you what um, the intermediate result will look like, for example. So you're going to have a situation where because of this multiplicity, you're going to create redundancy in your intermediate result. If you see what, so each of these values will join with this, create all possible combinations, and then join with that, create all possible combinations. So yes, my product feature, which is, uh, this is BSBM actually. So my product feature, I have multiple product features for some for product one here. But you see that because it joined with some other single value uh, um, uh, attributes or properties, this whole part is repeated while the multi-value property is going to occur just once, right? So you're going to repeat um, all of these values uh, while the multiple value, just because you have multiple values, uh, multi-value properties for product, uh, for product feature. Um, so imagine you have this 33 uh, million types. Now, um, this may not be a big deal, in the traditional query processing model, which is pipeline. So if you look at many of the query processing um, execution models are pipeline. If you look at how a query uh, operator is implemented, one query operator finishes one, um, one, two, one result, it passes it on to the next query operator. So at any time, actually, in a query plan, in the tree query plan, all the, all the operators are executing concurrently. We have what we call pipeline parallelism, right? They're all executing concurrently. Each it's is an iterator-based implementation. Each, each um, after generating one con one one combination, it will pass it on to the next oper next join operation to continue and so on and so. Forth. So you may not have a snapshot um, created that contains all this redundancy all at the same time, right? Or you don't have to at least you don't have to save it. Uh, materialize it in any way. Once you get to some kind of blocking operator then you have to save it, then this starts to become a little bit of a problem. But the bottom line is we're wasting a lot of space uh, doing this, um, which may not be a big issue for pipeline query process. Pro yes. so, but is that a problem because uh, you're not, uh, you're flattening things as opposed to having collection as a primitive that can fit into a... This is a exactly problem. where I'm going. Okay. But you see, the relational model by, de by default okay. Okay. is not normalized. I mean, so that's... To do sets and yes, extensions. exactly. And this is exactly where I'm going, and that's kind of the, the direction we went. So the relational model, just like it's alluding to, in first normal form means that you can only have atomic value. So starting from there up, you are forced to do this way, right? So this is exactly where, where we're going. We started to try to use a more nested model. If you use a more nested model, then you don't have to repeat things for multiple, but yes. So, so the vertical partitioner will still have three, three columns, yes, or maybe two, uh, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, it doesn't, actually, that's why I said, I, I, I said that, but it doesn't change anything. The bottom line is, I will have, as a matter of fact, this is vertical partition. The only thing is maybe just ignore the fact that we have yes. subject. So, the, but, but when you join them, right, you still end up having to generate combinations. It doesn't take away from the fact that you have to have combinations. The join result is join result. I mean, so that doesn't change anything. Only thing it changes is that the size, instead of having a single table, and then join it, do a self-join with itself, you have a couple of smaller tables. But it doesn't change the, what the result here will be. So how about the property tables? Yes, so property tables are great. Then we don't even have, we, this issue doesn't arise. No, it arises in the sense that it's pre So property table means we've grouped a couple of related properties together. So if we know that P, lab, P label and uh, whatever this is, P prop and so on, are going to frequently occur together, during the pre, we do a pre-processing and we kind of group them together ahead of time. So we basically do the join ahead of time and save it. But we still run into the same problem. But the join result is the join result. You've only you've done it ahead of time and you've actually saved it. Right? So you still have this um, as long as you're using first normal form you don't get away from this problem. It's just that now you've done it ahead of time versus um, doing it at runtime. Mm -hmm. So this is it's an orthogonal issue too what, what I was highlighting. Yeah. Do you get a sense that this um, uh, evolution of uh, relational strategies 
going to work out in the long term? Or is there something totally different in... That, so my feeling is that, uh, and of course I dare not say this to people like, where people like Michael Stonebreak and the also so on, uh, they will, but my feeling is that there are certain, that we, we need to be cautious about the way we lift relational, uh, so I think some of the stuff is very useful and some of the stuff makes sense to use, right? So in our case, we've kind of used what I would call a blend of, uh, but first thing is we have a nested, nested data model. But I think the notion of just... The nested entry models have been there for a while. Now. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. But commercial system nested, for, for the purpose of research, people propose nested relational algebra and so on. But then what happened with it? Then nobody really uses it, mm -hmm. right, in terms of commercial. Uh, and none of the semantic web query people, uh, data management systems use that. They all use this, right? None of them, nobody's using this. Mm -hmm. So for the purpose, if academic and research and discussion, yes, there are a couple of uh, models out there. Uh, but nobody use, uses it. Now, so we, we went with a nested. We can't really use the re, re, relational, uh, nested relational model uh, directly, but what we're using is nested. And maybe when I get to our model, I'll show you kind of what the differences are. Okay, so redundancy, and this has, this impacts really where you have to do, because uh, in, in uh, query processing, you have operators that we call blocking operators, and this means that these operators have to um, kind of finish everything and it's like a sorting operator or something, or something, aggregation or grouping. You have to basically finish everything and then save the, you know, materialize the result if you don't have enough space in memory for the next operator to consume. So uh, that's different from operators that are, can, can be, iter you know, that kind of pipeline, you know, partial results to the next one. So if you have this, then you have to worry about both space um, if you have blocking operators, you have to worry about both space because this is a waste of space here. Yeah? And if you know anything about, you know, about query optimization, when you, if, you, if you have to write anything to disk, you really worry about number of disk IOs. So you're sp spending a lot of disk IOs just waste, rewriting the same thing over and over again. It's a waste of uh, space. So, um, so I talked about kind of, oh, yes. The other thing which is, uh, yes, which um, uh, is besides the writing and reading, when you're doing in a distributed processing um, uh, environment, then sending over my network all these kind of repeated things is, a, is really a waste, of, waste of network. I mean, it's, you're costing, uh, adding to the cost unnecessarily. So centralized, because for the most time, most part, everybody's thinking about centralized pipeline, these were not issues and nobody was concerned about it. But now we're dealing with this distributed MapReduce, and I'm finding that these, we really have to think about these kind of problems. Okay. So, um, why is this here? Uh, I don't know, it's not in the right place. Basically, uh, still, the, I'll come back to this. I think it's supposed to be somewhere else. But basically, the point is, so, so far, I've kind of talked about where we are, we're in the qu structured query section of the discussion, basically saying that there are in additional dimensions to complexity that, you know, you only just add to the problems that I'm talking about here, uh, you know, that you have to deal with inference, you know, dealing with the stuff that's implicitly stated, which means, inferencing while we're querying, you add on top of the multiple joins that we have to do, the notion of grouping and aggregation. So now Sparkle 1.1 has added um, 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 grouping and aggregation to, to uh, Sparkle, and uh, this is what um, OLAP systems like Teradata and so on deal with, because uh, business analytics is about grouping things and analyzing, you know, what's your best which states have the highest sales for shoes or whatever, so you can figure out where to send more shoes. So you have to do these kinds of queries and they, they have, they're expensive on, on their own. So, so we add that, that challenge to what we already have. You can see that um, it starts to get increasingly um, complex. So now I'm going to say, you know, have all of what we've talked about now as context and we start saying, okay, let's now deal with the da big data dimension. So we have these you know, multiple joints, blah, 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 and big data dimension. So now we want to move from this single server centralized platforms to at least some kind of parallel or distributed platform because single node is not going to work, or not going to do the peta, da, peta, peta by data joins and so on and so forth, right? We, we need to do something, unless you, you are like have supercomputers or something like that. So everybody, now parallel databases um, have existed for a long time. You know, Teradata is kind of a leading um, vendor there. They have existed for a long time, but we go back to um, why the MapReduce um, kind of approach has taken off. Parallel databases were not designed to scale to the levels that we're talking about all the time. 
you know, decade ago or whenever, 20 years ago, when they were talking about this, we were talking about enter enterprise scale. Nobody was worrying about processing web data, right? So it was enterprise scale, the Walmart data, and even then Walmart didn't exist in all corners of the world. So the scale was completely different. So they're not designed to do this, and they kind of, because of that, the architecture they choose, they have these high, high speed interconnects and so on, you can't really scale them uh, um, beyond a certain point. So the question is now, how do you do it, and how do you do it in an affordable way? Because most of these servers that you use, so I remember when I was interning at HP, uh, Walmart is one of their customers, at least one of the 10. And so they buy these very expensive machines, to high-end servers, to do all our business analytics, right? So all our servers. You buy these very high-end machines, they're parallel machines, right? Parallel processors, everything very fancy. But now let's say your data has, you, Walmart acquires Kmart, and now they have twice as much data as they need to, ha to have. You cannot just simply go and scale that machine up, right? To, to deal with the larger amount of data. You need to, the architecture has to change, you have to turn everything off and get some people and pay another million dollars, and actually really a million dollars. I was very surprised that people actually paid me for, for you know, some meta. But yes, you pay a million dollars for them to add a few more processes, change architecture, because it's, those are very expensive. So then you go to people like you know, national labs. They have all this money to do this, but they're realizing, one of my colleagues is a, is a, post -nat is a former national lab. Um, you know, they have all these supercomputers, but anytime you're trying to scale from you know, 600 processors to double it, it's completely millions and millions of dollars. So now they're thinking about maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe they should, they're going to latch on to, to this whole notion of use commodity-grade machines. Regular PCs you can buy from the Best Buy. Right? Put them, if I need more, just add another one uh, to, to the network. Very simple, right? And um, very, very cheap, very easy to scale up. Don't have to hire any special people to add processes to the motherboard, nothing. But then, um, um, the challenge with, you never get anything for nothing, right? So the challenge with having this nice architecture is you have the, the, to be able to work with this architecture, this kind of architecture, you need a computational model, a programming model that fits, fits uh, that kind of architecture. And once you change the programming model, then everything we've thought about so far has to also change. How do we implement query operators in this programming model? How do we query process in this query programming model? So that changes the equation also. So, um, so now let me tell you about um, MapReduce, which is the, query, the programming model for uh, this commodity, uh, you know, just kind of use, scales very easily. Uh, you, you can run it on a commodity, uh, a cluster of commodity grade, commodity grade machines. Uh, the important thing we're going to focus on um, here is how does this model impact joins? Because we said joins are kind of the heart of IVF query processing. So how does this uh, affect join? query processing, and the cost models for deciding which joins should be done first and so, right? So that's my goal here. So first, MapReduce, um, it allows you to encode, oh, so so the other, uh, one, one thing that, there are two things it does. So one, it allows you to just parallelize over an arbitrarily sized cluster, right? It can be any size. And it also allows you, because for a long time, I mean, there have been, you know, MPI kind of programming models and so on, but you have to really be a special programmer to know how to program a, a parallel uh, environment, right? So one of the things that they've done is provide a very simple programming interface. You don't have to do anything fancy, just two, two functions. The API has two functions, a map function and reduce function. You don't have to worry about who's running where, whatever. That's, as long as your task can be, is, is, can be, can be um, partitioned such that I take my data set, I break it up into small pieces and just have the map function, each function run on each piece. As long as you can decompose your problem this way, this works very well. You don't have to worry about parallelization because the environment deals with it for you. So you have map function, and the map function, this job is to just take a key. So typically you take a key value pair. So you have a key and a value, and the map function is to map. It will map it to another key and another value. So sometimes you may map uh, multiple keys to the same value. That's why we have a list. You may have a list at the end of a map phase. But basically, just take a tuple. Imagine a tuple. Take one of the columns as the key, and or take one tuple and just decide what the key should be and map it to that. That's it. So uh, reduce. The job of the reduce is to take everything with the same key. So you have a key. Whatever all the values that are associated with a key, you have a list of those reduce it, apply some reduce function that reduces in some way, 
I'm, I'm trying to remember this. Then we'll see an example. So the, tra the thing here is mm, we can execute each of these functions in parallel. And Apache Hadoop is, so Google published what they, what they did, but they never gave anybody source code, right? So what are their, um, um, uh, the Apache, uh, 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 we now have an implementation, so Yahoo kind of took this up, and based on what they wrote in their paper, reconstructed what they did, and now we have an open source version of it, which is called Hadoop. And um, so basically this is how it works. This is the general uh, architecture, it's master-slave, you have a master at the top, you have a couple of slaves, and the slaves are split into kind of two, two types of slaves. You have the mapper, mappers, and their job is to execute the map function, and you have the reducers, and their job is to execute the reducer function. So you have a, a master or job tracker in Hadoop sense. Uh, you have a file system which basically has your data, but you've broken your data into equal size chunks. So this is kind of what this is showing you. So the job of the master is, okay, take each chunk, and uh, assign a chunk to a particular mapper. So basically say, you know, mapper one, you do this chunk, mapper two, you do that chunk. And then each mapper will execute the map function. They will do what I just said, which is uh, map each, to, each data item, whatever the data item is, to a key value. Huh? So you see this mapper has this, this one has this, and so on and so forth. Then, um, we save, so pay attention to this. So what I want us to pay attention to in this model is the number of times, or uh, the times that we're doing disk IO, because when you do query optimization, cost is really, you mostly focus on disk IO because that's the dominant cost. Anything happening in memory is very trivial. Hmm? So um, we pay attention to number of the, to the disk IOs and we pay attention to any network data transfers because that's another significant cost that we have to deal with. So I talked about reading from the, um, from a distributed file system, that's an IO. Huh? And then I talk about the mappers, they write to their local disk, that's an IO. Now we decide, we group, we basically, this is what's called the shuffle phase. You take all, you say, okay, the, the job tracker says, okay, register one, you're going to do with everything that has to do with key, uh, key, 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 K1. So everybody that has K1, for example, this tuple comes here, that tuple comes here, all the K1s come to register one, and there they get reduced in some way. So we shuffle, we sort, we have to sort and shuffle, you know, to sort all, and get all the K1s together and get all the K2s. And then we have to sort and transfer across the network because these, this is a cluster and the network could be, you know, it could be distributed over, over a wide area. So basically you send this over a network and then you, each user will then apl um, apply its um, uh, reduce function and then output the uh, key value, the reduced values. And then this output means we're writing it actually back to the disk. So note here, uh, sorry, not to the disk, to the distributed file system. So the cost of one map reduce cycle is read, write, sort, this, these are the key costs I talked about, right? The read, write, sort, we have to, and then uh, reduce write. Okay, so given this, we have to deal with large number of joins, large data, large number of queries. I'll talk about these all later. Let's now see how we can do join processing in this, in this uh, environment. So we can take our key, uh, key value pairs to be tuples. And um, basically we take, uh, 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 so if you imagine you just give your map function some tuple using any arbitrary key, it doesn't matter. But because we're trying to join tuples, you're going to now map that tuple to its join key. So basically, you take, let's say I want to do a join on uh, A column three here to B column two. So when I take the tuples from A, I'm going to extract out as the key, the join key, K1. And when I come for relation B, I'm going to extract out the key uh, from the join column K2. The goal is when we put them together in the reduce function, the two tuples with the same join key will be together. We can just, uh, reduce will essentially join them together. So that's how that works. So reduce function will take this tuple because it has the same key, get that tuple has the same key. Reduce function, we just implement basically appending them together, that's a join. So now imagine that, so that was just a single join. And uh, we talked about you know, the cycle involved in one join, read, write, shuffle, and so on and so forth. 
So now imagine this very relatively simple query. It has a couple of joints, I think seven or so. And we go, um, one of the things that, um, oh, so I should mention what pig is. So um, one, of the less, one of the things that um, Facebook and Yahoo did was say, you know, we, we don't want people, although we have this nice map function and reduce function, a uh, simple interface, we want to learn from um, relational query uh, optimization and processing. You don't ask users to implement data processing primitives, right? Because inside the map function, I have to implement this join thing and I have to implement you know, the map part and so on. We don't want that. This is kind of going backwards. So what, what relational systems, because then the, re, the challenge with that is that you have to then figure out the optimized algorithm. If I give you a couple of joins and a couple of groupings and so on, you, the user will then have to be forced to figure out how, what should the MyReduce function be. We don't want to do that. What, what relational systems did was provide SQL, a high level query language. You write something that looks like English and then the system does the rest for you, right? It comes up with the optimized code. So um, Yahoo then said, okay, let's build a high-level SQL-like language on top of this MapReduce um, framework. And they have some system called Pig, which is now also moved to the open source space. And so there I can express, they don't have a select from where, but they can express a high, basically high-level primitives. You have load, filter, join kind of keywords. I can express these kinds of things, and then I, it will just get compiled into what I just showed you a few minutes ago, which is the map function and the and the reduce function. That's the query processing job. So there, you can express, the main thing I wanted to highlight is, there, the optimization that they allow is if you have multiple joins that are going to be happening on the same, same key, which is very common, so basically a star join. So if we look here, you have a, a couple of um, triple patterns with the same subject, a variable, so that's a star, basically you can think of it as a star if this is a node another star join and another star join. So many idea of queries actually you can view in terms of these star joins. So we have a number of star joins and so what they, what they can do is instead of doing one join for each cycle, they can group all these star joins because the join key is the same. You can group these three, basically do this star join as one cycle and so basically you have one cycle for this, one map reduce cycle is what I mean by cycle. One here, one here and another one to join between the stars. So this is basically what the um, um, basically, they have something called like a load. You load your data set. You filter because the first triple pattern is on price. You filter, basically, you apply a filter condition. They have a filter keyword. You get the price. You also have to do some other filter to get the product and get the third filter to get the vendor. And then you can do join T price, T product, and T vendor on subject. This is kind of how you would write in pig, uh, pig Latin. So you do that, and then you do another similar set for the second star another similar step for the third star, and then you do one other one for the intermediate results and join J1 and for J2. So all, to, all together, I've annotated here each one with the number, with the cycle, so all this happened in one cycle. MRO2 is the second map reduce cycle, the third cycle, and so on. So you would have five map reduce cycles basically for this query if you execute in pig. Now, a couple of things to note. So the MapReduce execution workflow, this is now what our execution plan looks like in the MapReduce world. You have a sequence of MapReduce cycles. Each one has a cost that I talked about before, which has all the shuffle and map reads and writes. So each of them have a separate cost. And um, a couple of things to note. At, at the end of each, so first I'm going to load here. No, notice I'm loading triples, that, there's a, an input file called triples at RDF, which is kind of my triple relation. Notice I loaded here, I loaded here, and all the other steps that I didn't show you, you have to load so many times. So you load, you repeat the scans for triple relation. The other thing is that um, 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 because of the model that I showed earlier, um, here, you read, you save intermediate results, you transfer over the network, you compute, reduce, reduce, you save intermediate, next, uh, intermediate results here, you start another cycle, you read, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of reading, writing, that's basically the point I'm trying to, to, to send home here. Okay. So, they're, they're relational, so it's not necessarily pig's fault, but basically they use a relational interpretation of this kind of query. You look at these, uh, they're called kind of star drawings, you try to do each star, what I call star sub-patterns, you do one, one MapReduce cycle for each. Um, 
And then if you have a couple of grouping aggregations and so on, you have to do those um, uh, later on. Now, what we're arguing is that this is not um, adequate, that we can do a little bit more, as particularly given the cost of each cycle being so high, we can try to do so, view, uh, 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 fewer, so that we have fewer of these cycles. The other thing is that we want to do, because of all this reading and writing of intermediate results and transferring over the network, we don't want these repeated uh, waste, you know, basically trans writing um, um, repeated val um, uh, redundant values because of the multiplicity problem that I highlighted of, uh, um, uh, in, in the previous slide. In the relational world, this is just is your intermediate result, and you just you have to read it and you have to write it. But if we view the queries a little bit differently, then maybe we can avoid this problem. So, what does this mean? We need to rethink the way we implement operators in terms of MapReduce computation model. So, what what have we done? So, I'm not paying attention to the time, but. Uh, we have until 12.30ish. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. So, um, what's this now? Yes. So what we, did, what we did was, okay, if you look at this table, hmm, this is my input for RDF, whatever, that input that RDF. If you look at this table, rather than think of them as joins, okay, so this is my, this was the query that I uh, had in the previous, or uh, something like the query. So, rather than think of this as one star join, one star join, and then try to join the stars and so on, this is how I think of a query. I have an input file. I apply a group by operation. I just apply a group by operation. If I apply a group by operation on my subject column, for example, hmm, I'll end up with groups. So this group will be a group of tuples that have the same subject. This will be another group of uh, tuples that have the same subject. Now, if you look at um, the structure of these groups. So this group, if you look at this group, this group looks a little bit like this group of triples right here. Hmm? So if I also consider this a group of triple patterns and this a group of triples, this group looks like this group. If you ignore, um, I can eliminate the ones that I'm not using. So I, the query tells me exactly the properties I want. So when I'm loading, I can filter out. So that's no problem. So we've crossed out the ones that we don't want. We just get groups. Now I can basically Concurrently, so you can think of it this way. So concurrently, just by doing a group by operation, instead of thinking of them as joins, I can concurrently compute the sub result, the, the intermediate result for this subquery, and the intermediate result for this subquery, because that kind of matches up over here, right? And if I have k stars, doesn't matter how many stars I have, group by computes all of them concurrently. The only thing is, my result doesn't look like a flat tuple like I normally have. My result is a group of tuples a group of triples, which if I flatten them, they will look like a, a relational tuple. The other thing is, um, which I'll show in the other space. So this is going towards now a nested model. Um, so the nice thing about a group by is that I can do a group by in map producing one cycle. So it doesn't matter how many sub, if I had five or six other star joins here, in the relational world, because I'm forced to view this as, as joins, I, could, I have to do each star join separately and then link them together. In this case, I don't think of them, I just do a group by, a group by will do all of them concurrently in one cycle. So I eliminate, I go immediately from five cycles down to four, I mean down to one or two. Um, so, so, so then, um, so this is kind of the mapping which I was trying to show. So the question then becomes, uh, so this will be the, uh, what the group by results look like. Um, so the question then becomes, um, oh yeah, one more thing. The only, the two things, one is, I now have a res uh, my intermediate, my result, the result of my group by, like I said, is the, now has um, candidate answers for multiple subqueries. So this one, this part matched match the first star pattern, this part matched the second star pattern. So unlike a relational situation where um, your intermediate result has a, one semantic here, I have multiple possible um, results. So I have to label them so that I know in the end who belongs to what and then I can figure out how to link them up together. So basically we're going to label each intermediate result based on the subquery that, that they match. So here I just use the list of properties uh, as the label. So I, I've said before you can do this all as grouping. So now, so this led us to, okay, now we have this notion of um, um, a group of triples, which we call a triple group. Hmm? And so, given a triple groups with multiple values, yeah, in the relational case where if I had done a star join, I would have something like this. 
right? Where this is repeated, this is repeated, this is repeated, and the only thing that's um, uh, not repeated is the multi-value property. In my notation, as a, when you represent as a group of triples, this is what I have. I have no redundancy at all in my intermediate results. Hmm? And uh, so, so then we said to ourselves, okay, so that means we're now, we now have a data model that's basically in terms of groups of triples instead of tuples. So after we get these uh, groups of triples, we need to basically join them back together, and we have some other operations that we have to do. So basically now we need a new algebra. We need a new data model and a new algebra. We need to define operators and triple groups, so to speak. So that led us a, a, um, to a couple of basic operators. There's a notion of join between triple groups and so on and so forth, which I won't necessarily um, uh, get into. So oh, the other thing is, um, because a group by doesn't impose the same structural constraints that it joined us. So a join says join A, B, and C, which means in the result, I must have one, one part of the result that comes from A, one part of the result comes from B, and one part of the result comes from C. Group by doesn't have any notion of a, fill, of a constraint. It just groups everything that's together. So I may have B missing or C missing and so on. So basically, to be able to really have an equivalent result, if you look at, we had to prove writing and so on. To have an equivalent result, uh, uh, it's not just a group, it's a group followed by some kind of filtering. Between. So, but for example, in this case, um, as, assuming I did kind of a, a group by here, I would have something, I could have something like a, this triple group as one potential triple group. Here I have vendor, I have a product, I have uh, uh, the other, I don't have the other two, uh, which in the, in the rational model I would have to have for for this to be a valid result. So this result is not, is not valid. So a join for us is equivalent to, well, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically there's a grouping and then a filtering to make sure that all the components match. And then, for example, in this case, there's a, a, a mapping for each triple pattern that's required in the query, and so that's how we... A, so how far is it from uh, labeling it as an object-oriented model? Actually, maybe not very far. Except that in object oriented model, for example, you would have also two separate objects, I believe, for for uh, for this. So, for example, uh, how would you do this actually? See, well, all of them are the same, right? So, mm -hmm. if I have object as a focus, then all these are just attributes of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Then it will be yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So it's very similar actually. Now, uh, but then what? So what we had to do? So in this case, you, for the object oriented model, we would have to have a notion of. Uh, filtering, for example, what this means, so, so that is, that's a little bit, bit different. And then what it, basically if we had two of these, like we had in the previous slide, we had two different triple groups, we had to have a notion of uh, joining them. So for example, we have this is one triple group and another triple group, all in the same intermediate result, we basically have to split them into equivalence classes and then define a notion of a join, and then you start to get something that's um, a little bit different. So anyway, so this is kind of what, 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 um, what, um, um, what we're doing in MapReduce, so I'll tell you some. Uh, this, uh, so, okay, so before I do that, uh, basically what this amounts to is uh, there's some equivalence notions between what the operations that we have and uh, operations in the relational world, which uh, Pig Latin and uh, Facebook's Hive have. And so, if you, they, we will have one MapReduce cycle for n MapReduce cycles that they have on this side if you have n, n star joints. And then the size of our intermediate result is smaller because we have an implicit representation versus the flat, the denormalized representation. So this is a very old result. I don't even know why I'm showing this, but this basically shows um, some differences between performance in terms of, um, this is very, really, really old, um, um, a uh, using our, so what we did, how did we do this? We took Apache Pig and we, we implemented a new set of operators, a new query planner, and everything inside Apache Pig. So basically, in our system, both old Apache Pig and our query, query, compilation, query compilation process coexist. So last year at VLDB, we had showed a demo where we tried even hybrid plans, some, a plan with half relational operators, half NTG operators, to try to see are there benefits of combining them, in which cases do we outperform, and so on. We haven't yet found any case where a, a, a hybrid plan would outperform, but we did, that was kind of what our demo was about. Uh, we always, our plans always ended up being, um, and I think the second part of it is because initially I was thinking about it just in terms of reducing the number of cycles, was recently it hit me that also this uh, smaller footprint in terms of, we check the number of bytes they write and the number of bytes we read and write, and ours is much smaller. I think that's why we always 
and perform even when we have the same number of cycles. So the other things we started now trying to do, so that's like I said, very, very old. Um, um, so the other thing we started trying to do now is we, that, that, that the query that we looked at there was um, uh, a very simple query. All properties were bound, no, nothing complicated. Now we're starting to look at more complex queries, unbound property queries, um, um, and so we basically try to find uh, ways of, uh, um, because when we have this nested model, but if we have to let, we may have to unnest it if we are going to do a join. So we looked at different unnesting strategies and so on and so forth. So I can talk about the results with you. I think the ones that you're probably a little bit more interested in, I just want to highlight the impact this now has on what we're currently looking at, which has to do with um, reasoning. Hmm? Uh, we talked about dealing with implicit data. Uh, uh, so there are basically two approaches. Uh, the approaches that exist primarily are basically look at your data, look at the rules, infer every possible thing ahead of time, materialize that as an explicit data set, and then you can just query normal, right? So that you can do. Um, so big LM is kind of one of the top in this area. And so you can look at, uh, they have maybe 12 billion statements and you can they can do this, uh, some, these are some results we kind of extracted from papers. Took like uh, 290 hours, right? So that's a long time to wait. But the most important thing also is that um, if you change anything, if you now insert a new tuple, so velocity issue, if you have new data coming in, you have to recompute, materialize, recompute your, your closure again and again. So if you have to wait 290 hours each time for new data, then you can imagine that this is not a practical solution at all. Um, so the the um, there are some parts. So this was a single node server. There's some um, uh, RDFS implemented. This is for RDFS uh, a closure a computation, which was done on uh, 64 nodes, and that took about one hour. But still has this problem of uh, having to reprocess this time as a change. So um, now, if we want to apply um, um, this whole parallel processing, because you may not have access to 64 nodes, right? Here on campus, you may not have 64 nodes to do your stuff on. Right, you may have only five, ten nodes. So maybe you're a scientist, and once once a month you need to run some parallel, you know, do integrate a bunch of data which needs closure and so on. So you can go to Amazon and request a cluster and do this, right? So you first you have to transfer your data there. Now that that's one thing, but um, for for um, um, there's a paper at ISWC last year that talked about. If you use this approach of, okay, go to Amazon, rent something, so Vertrosa has some kind of image you can use on, on Amazon. You can do this, and so for the experiments that they wanted to run, they had about uh, how many queries, I don't remember how many, uh, how many queries they needed to run, but to be able to start running the queries, first you need to take 61 hours to do the closure. Then after 61 hours, your queries will be very fast because you've materialized everything, so it would then take uh, two hours to run however many queries they had, like 10 queries. But you have to pay Amazon, right? So you have to do 61 plus hours plus three, two hours, or whatever, that's 63 hours. Now, that's because you have to do all this thing ahead of time. Now, these other people propose some other approach which didn't require indexing, and just run your, your queries in situ, and, uh, and the, do your query inferencing on the fly, and they took just eight hours to run this, so uh, run the eight queries. So it's one hour per, per query, yes, but in terms of how much money you have to pay Amazon, it's much less. Hmm? So, so we think that, um, we want to try to improve this idea of not requiring 61 hours, but eight hours is still a lot to, to, to spend just to run eight queries, you know, average of one hour per query. So when we started looking at this, it turned out that actually because of this notion of group by basically keeping multiple, um, multiple sub-results or multiple uh, um, uh, sub-query results concurrent, managing them concurrently, we're able to actually do some, uh, have some impact on, 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 uh, on reasoning. Now, what they, I talked about the materialization approf, approach for reasoning. The other approach is kind of a database, so people like George Gottlob and so on work on. So they say, we can take a query, an inferencing query, and we expand it all the different possible ways based on the inferencing rules. Hmm? So if I take a query and I inf expand it all the different possible ways, that gives me a number of Subqueries, then I compute each one, and if I get the union of the results, that's my that's my answer to that's the answer to my query. Hmm? So basically, translate the query to a union of conjunctive queries. Each conjunctive query uh, 
can be dealt with by any uh, relational database. And then you just union all the results. So for example, this is a query on LUBM. Uh, so they have this notion of um, member of, but they have sub properties which says that somebody, if somebody is a head of something, person is also a member of and so on. So if I ask for member of, then I must ask for both member of, member of, head of, works for. I have to do one query for each of the different ways that I can expand. And if you, have, if you can expand this three ways and I can expand this five ways, then altogether I talk about 15 different possible queries. So um, we've looked at some queries and for this I went, I've really been looking at um, uh, uh, real queries. Uh, so this is basically you take, basically what I said, you, you would do each query, each subquery, and then union the results. Each query by itself will have its own joins and everything. So just total all the number of possible cycles that you're going to need for that. Versus what we've done. If you look at this, um, these are the three, imagine that we could expand the original query we had into just these three queries. Imagine that was the case. Then I can take this and say, okay, I'm interested in, so a type is somewhat fixed. Let's just imagine that it's fixed. And the alternatives are member of works for and head of. You can think of this as alternatives as optional. Uh, if you're familiar with Sparkle, there's an optional kind of a construct. And so this is what uh, some people from Utah did last year. They rewrote this as an optional. They were not doing this for MapReduce. Um, so basically what this is, you can, if you do that, then you can make, uh, you might be able to reduce the number of cycles. It doesn't always work very well, uh, work that way, but you might be able to reduce that cycle. So optional fragments are done using a left outer joint. So you have a separate cycle for each left outer joint, but you can do something like that. On the other hand, what we've done, and I'm, uh, you know, I would like to talk about this some more if anybody's interested. What we've done is, you can think of each of these subqueries, the different three subqueries, as a different equivalence class. When I say different equivalence, remember I said we label each sub-result with the equivalence class because they're different multiple sub-results in the same group by result. So basically, what it means is that when I do my group by, I say to my, I say to my query processor, I want to look for this pattern, or this pattern, or this pattern, or this pattern. So I move it from being a union query to a disjunctive query, which, which, is, which changes things a bit. A disjunctive query on my triple groups. That means I can, um, this is not right, that should be disjunction, it should be the other way around. Um, but let me give you, um, yeah, this is a better example. Um, so here we, ha we had something with, um, we, we had something with um, uh, on Uniprot. Uniprot is a bio data set. And actually, in the case of Uniprot, there were a number of just a simple query that had three patterns. When we expanded it, we had to have 36, com it was 36 combinations. So there were 36, um, nine and four, there were 36 sub, sub queries. So you have the first sub pattern union, next pattern, and so on. So if you do that versus, where am I going up and down? If you do that versus trying to say, um, implement the, the uh, the three, the 36 patterns as for each triple group, check check this uh, structure versus that structure versus that structure. If you do it that way, uh, using uh, our, our approach, this is what um, the result looks like. You can use, this is uh, our computation time for that, the query I just showed. Um, uh, this is of course timeline. This is doing this as a union of 36 queries. So each, each one here, is one in time for one query. And then this is using the left outer join uh, approach, rewriting using left outer join to show basically it doesn't always, there are some cases where it works better, but, but you can see there's a significant difference um, for, for performance uh, in, in terms of using our approach. So this is kind of a uh, uh, direction that we're just, we just started working on in general, this is a different query result. Um, um, but this is the direction that we're going um, and I'll just mention one or two other things. Uh, in terms of query classes, um, we're looking at, so we've, I've talked about graph patterns, talked about um, query, queries with inferencing. The other thing is that you know, we have a graph model, we may want to do more graph-oriented queries, like finding paths and so on and so forth. And particularly, there have, been, there have been some people working on paths, but most of them assume you're looking for the shortest path. Most of them also assume that you're doing a single node, single destination. 
But oftentimes, most times actually, you're not interested in a single, no single. You have a list of sources, like a list of terrorists and a list of whatever. You always have more, more, more than one person, like drug targets versus genes or something like that. There's always multiple sources. So if you want to use this approach, single source algorithms, you have to, decomp you have to run the algorithm one time for each source. Hmm? And if your data is on disk, you have to be reading your, it's just the, the IO patterns are terrible. So this is just an example from an old paper. But what we did with the WWF paper that Dr. Chet was talking about, which we just have, I had got accepted, was we have a very different model. It's not a navigational model like a depth first, so it's not a Dijkstra style model. And basically what we do is try to do all the subqueries concurrently. And this is another theme that we're going towards, multi-query up to optimization. How many, can you do multiple queries at the same time? How do you group queries? Just like we did with the reasoning, group all these subqueries into one and do at the same time using this uh, disjunction, we're doing a similar theme for multi-query um, optimization. So I won't explain this unless somebody's interested, but the bottom line here is to observe that, so we're running path queries. Uh, we have a number of sources, for example, in this case, um, source number one, two, and three. And what, one of the things you, you will realize is if you look at each computation separately, they have some shared so if you look at this, this, each row represents the execution for one source. So this is row number one. And here we represent paths using a regular expression. So this says a path, uh, there's one path from node one to four. I mean, there are two paths. One is K, the second one is A followed by C. So this is how we represent paths. So, um, so this is the execution for one, this execution for two, node two, and this execution for five. But you see that if you start to look from uh, dot C, the tail, the suffix of the computation is similar for both cases. So see so here, yeah, dot C, dot D, dot C, dot D, dot C, dot D, dot E, dot C, dot D. So basically, if you separate this computation, you're repeating this computation over and over again if you, you know, 